Hello, and welcome to Digfin Vox, Voices in Digital Finance. I'm your host, James DiBiazio. If you enjoy this program, give us a like, share it, subscribe. My guest today is Lauren Isi, Director of Fixed Income Technology Vendor TradeWeb and Singapore-based Director of AIX, its toolkit for workflows to automate trading and execution. We spoke about trends in automating Asia's markets for bonds, swaps, and FX, and how the region's asset managers are using technology to create new ways to trade and to measure dealer performance. Laurent Ishii from TradeWeb, welcome to DigFinVox. Hey, James. Great to be here. Uh, great to have you. Uh, looking forward to this conversation. You are at the forefront of some big trends uh, making their way worldwide and particularly in Asia Pac in the electronification of fixed income. This is uh, maybe not new, but it's still a, it, it's certainly new compared to the equities world. Um, and TradeWeb, uh, you know, you're in an electronic marketplace. You provide people access to markets and data and analytics uh, to enable them to uh, trade all kinds of instruments, not just fixed income. But I, I believe you are the person who helped came up to came out to Asia Pacific and set up a lot of the capabilities in the fixed income space here. So I think you're the right person to talk about this trend of electronic uh, trading becoming mainstream uh, and finding uses in new types of instruments uh, in, in Asia PAC. So, um, you know, really bringing that that fintech uh, touch to how uh, buy and sell sides interact and trade fixed income. So what I'd like to understand is we're at the start of a new year. Um, let's look back at 2023. What were one or two big themes in Asia bonds uh, that you think are the most relevant for, for the marketplace right now? So I think there is a variety of things, and I, I think you touched on a couple of, of topics, right? I mean, the electronification is something that is happening very quickly um, around the world, and obviously Asia is no exception to this. Um, we've seen quite a bit of increased participation, especially on the automated trading side using AIEX. Um, on the asset manager front, um, we've seen sovereign wealth funds adopted and hedge funds. Um, the AI, other big... AIEX is, is your platform, your marketplace. Uh, exactly. AIEX is the tool clients can use to do automated execution um, on the trader platform, essentially. Um, it's a process that helps them uh, move from clicking through or the execution of orders to codifying rules that then are applied to the orders so that the orders can be processed uh, automatically without the trader having to uh, take care of every single order. Yeah. What is the, besides the technology itself, what, what is the impetus for whether it's from, from the, the sell side with the banks or the, the hedge fund and uh, asset manager side uh, or, or, the, or the asset owners like sovereign wealth funds? What's the impetus for them to go electronic? Because equities have been electronic for a very long time now. Um, but equities trade on the centralized exchanges. Uh, you know, they're very different beast to an OTC market uh, that's uh, maybe more customizable. I don't, I don't know what the, how you would characterize that. But you know, why why is this happening now as opposed to say twenty years ago when equities were also going electronic? Um, I think there's a variety of aspects to that. One big component to it is technology has evolved quite a bit, and certain things can be done today that you simply couldn't do 20 years ago um i think the other thing is also market structure changes that you've seen um especially i mean if we're looking at the real money space for example they have um increased the adoption of indexing and funds uh, which require more and more frequent rebalancings and more re frequent rebalancings means the average trade size um can come down over time and then uh, that lends itself to automation, right? Because it's smaller trades, they're easier to digest by the market. Um, the other thing is, is I think that certain clients have realized what they can actually do, um, in particular uh, on the automated side. Um, you take hedge funds, for example, right? They, they have uh, deployed systematic strategies um, for exchange listed products for many, many years. And I think they have realized that the same things can be applied to bonds or swaps. 
um, with the offering that we have essentially. Okay. With all these changes, it, it's, you know, you, you talked about swaps or rates. Uh, there's a lot of different product types in the fixed income world, right? It's not just, you know, it, I guess US government treasuries, which is the biggest and most liquid market, that's probably been easier to, to automate. What else is, what kind of markets, what kind of products are seeing the most adoption and where is there still uh, barriers or frictions to, to going electronic? It's, it's a very good question. I mean, in principle, you can trade now, at least from the, the, the products that TradeWeb support, uh, you can trade them all electronic, right? That's why we're in the marketplace. Um, right. But in terms of what you can actually automate and auto-execute, there is obviously big differences. As you mentioned, right, treasuries are very, very liquid. It's very straightforward. Um, even during Asian hours, liquidity is plenty. Um, however, I think what's interesting is that... Uh, Kind of, especially if you look at the less liquid products, it's not a question whether you can automate them or you cannot automate them. It's rather more if you want to make the effort and um, try to apply the correct type of rule sets to it, you can actually work it out. And I think that's what we've, we've seen in, in the Asia region um, quite consistently is uh, people obviously have approached the automation and said, okay, we can do that in... Uh, treasuries, how can we do it in Australian government bonds? How can we do it in JGBs, so the Japanese government bonds, the Chinese government bonds, or for that matter, in the EM swap space? And I think what's been very interesting to see there is essentially um, not only that it can be done, but it also leads to changes, not just on the buy side, but it also leads to changes on the sell side, where the sell side then starts to say, okay, if the buy side's automating, then we also need to change certain things on our side. And the sell side, for example, starts to auto quote some of these products, where mm -hmm. even two and a half years ago, uh, before I got to APAC, that wasn't the case in some of these products. There was literally zero auto quoting. Um, even though they were some of the most significant bond markets in the world. Right. How is this having an impact on the way, I guess, the push pull between the buy side and the sell side? So, you know, in the equities world, uh, you know, 20 years ago, uh, a dealer on a, in a big fund management company was basically just taking orders, uh, just, you know, handling tickets, not, not really adding anything else. Uh, with electronification, that began to change and the, I guess, the influence uh, began to shift uh, more toward the buy side away from the banks. But in fixed income, you've got uh, different dynamics and also you've got just this huge interbank market. So um, I guess who is, you know, where are you seeing the lead in, in at least in Asia Pac, when you're looking at all these different markets and the way that you apply these, these learnings of automation? Uh, is the impetus coming and is it being driven by uh, primarily from banks doing uh, trading amongst one another, or is it, or, or is it, uh, is it the, the buy side or some of the sovereign funds that are saying we want this, and therefore the, the counterparts begin to line up and start using these tools? Where where do you see that momentum? I think if we if we look back at kind of the evolution that we've seen, right in in Europe and the U.S. Uh, to come back to the Treasury example uh, before we look at Asia. There, it was driven by the sell side, right? The sell side has automated treasury quoting a long time ago, um, and the buy side basically only taps into that, right? In Asia, okay. I think the trend's actually in the reverse. Um, a mm. lot of the, the buy sides have said, look, we, we want to do this because A, either we're doing it globally or we have done it in other products, so we want to bring this into the APAC-relevant product, the local products, essentially, right? I said... Japanese government bonds, or Australia government bonds, or EM swaps, right? And I think that's where the, the, the dynamic is different, where it was more of a kind of dealer-led part in the rest of the world. A lot of it is tr being driven um, by the buy side. Um, and and it, it's all the buy side. So as it's the, the real money, uh, long-only asset managers, the sovereign wealth funds, the hedge funds that really have contributed to that um, push from the from the buy side um not to say that the sell side haven't done anything they are obviously also working on it um but it, i would say it's more driven from the buy side compared to other regions at least 
within APAC, we have a, you know, a massive variety of markets uh, and different regulations on, on those places. Uh, you know, some of these currencies are not convertible. Uh, you know, so it's they end up being just traded offshore. Um, others, you can just do direct market access very easily. Um, walk me through a little bit of that spectrum, uh, starting maybe with, you know, I guess Australia and Japan, I would assume, are probably the most uh, easy to, easy, you know, large liquid, easy to access markets. And then take us through where you see, um, you know, where's the edge right now in this region in terms of opening up some markets or b being more successful at, at developing the um, automated and access, electronic access? Yeah, um, I think it, it's, I mean, as you said, right, Japan and Australia, that's quite straightforward. Um, it's also from a trade web perspective, we um, engage both with the clients directly as well as with the dealer community directly. So for us to be able to uh, get the full end-to-end -end understanding and have the, the consistent communication is, is very straightforward. Um, Obviously, there is other markets um, in Asia, in particular China, for example, where um, the model is slightly different um, from a regulatory perspective. You um, have TradeWeb, which um, for the for the northbound connect schemes, uh, TradeWeb uh, interacts with the clients, and then um, CFET brings the dealers to the table. And I think what's been interesting from our perspective is clients have still wanted to automate these trades as well and but have realized very early on that the approach is slightly different and we kind of needed to work uh, with the environment that we had at hand um, and we're very successful and actually it led to quite a bit of client adoption last year i think it was one of the fastest uh, adopted products in terms of um, capabilities right we've done China from the get-go, but the automation was picked up really, really quickly by the by the buy side. Yeah. Once you enable that kind of uh, access um, and, and improved automation, what kind of knock-on effects does that have? Does that, you know, not insert, not maybe directly in terms of trading something on, on AI, you know, through your AIX tool, but when things become more electronic, uh, does that create uh, a broader marketplace, new entrants? Does it create new products, um, you know, exchange traded products or uh, new types of, of derivatives? Um, you know, what, what does it what does it do to a marketplace when it becomes more and more electronic? Um, I think it allows the adoption and deployment of new strategies. Um, I think that's something that we see very prominently from from the hedge funds, for example. They um, we're not necessarily the first ones to do auto execution in, in a variety of products, um, but have um, come to realize that there is actually the, that channel to do certain trade strategies, which they wouldn't have been able to do otherwise, uh, just for simple reasons. They, they are not necessarily staffed. If they're fully systematic, they're not necessarily staffed to have uh, people sit there and execute trades one after another. Um, so they will do that. And I think that's kind of what has changed for, from a trade web perspective. Um, and obviously also creates a different type of liquidity in the market, right? Um, they, they will have different objectives um, in terms of trade executions than the existing um, market participants have, right? Even other hedge funds will have different trading objectives uh, if they're non-systematic, for example. Um, and on the asset manager side, I think what we've seen is the more they can electronify and automate at the end of the day is the more frequent they can rebalance, which leads to more, more accurate tracking um, of mm. the indexes for the end investor. And the other thing it does, as I said, because the average trade size, if you, if you trade, you're rebalancing, I don't know, once a month, um, mm. then your average trade size is relatively large, right? And it's, it tends to be more of a hands-on uh, exercise. If you do the rebalancing daily or, or every other day or whatever, then the average trade size becomes smaller, which is easier to be absorbed by the market, which allows more electronification and automation at the end of the day. Okay. What are you seeing in terms of the, the skill sets that your clients are 
using the sort of people that you might have interacted with, say, five years ago versus today? You know, what are the, the, the skill sets, whether it's a, a buy or sell side desk that automation is enabling or uh, encouraging? It's a good question. Um, purely from a skill set, I don't necessarily think a trader needs uh, anything massively different um, to a couple of years ago. I know there is a big push to put uh, people with coding skills on trading desks, and that may certainly have its use cases. Um, mm -hmm. I, how should I say, from a trader perspective, it's not required, right? We uh, provide a ready-made solution, um, so there's no additional coding needed. Um, from For the automation part, uh, what's been very interesting with AX, I think the reason why it has worked really, really well for customers is because um, we can provide a complete solution. They only need to fill in the rules, um, which we can customize for them. Um, but it's always kind of following a same pattern, conceptually at least, right? And making it simple really has helped uh, them. Um, I think the one thing that I would say uh, that we have observed uh, in, more broadly is um, that there is certain benefits uh, to firms if they adopt uh, early on because mm -hmm. they have direct impact on on shaping uh, some of the protocols, some of the ways we're doing things uh, because we will work with them to help them achieve what they're looking to get done essentially. Where so just this is sort of going back to the uh, original topic you're talking about sort of the geographic spread of uh, automation. But where is it a great time now to be a, an early adopter so that you can shape that conversation in your marketplace, but either by product or by geography? Um, if you, how should I say, we on the bond side we've progressed actually quite far already. Um, but if you look at kind of where we are in Asia relative to the rest of the world. Um, I think in terms of total adoption ratios, we're still somewhat behind, but we're mm -hmm. catching up really, really fast. So there's still a lot to be done um, on, on the APAC side. In terms of the product, where I think we're going to see a lot more of more adoption over the next couple of years and in, independent of where uh, people actually sit, is I think we're still going to see more adoption in especially the Asia rates um, to catch up with to similar levels of automation that we see in, in European uh, rates, for example. But then um, the other big topic that I see is uh, interest rate swaps. I think that's where we're going to have um, a lot of adoption happening uh, over the next few years as we build our protocols and customers um, start to adopt them. Yeah, just give us a real very basic 101 here on on this uh, rates swaps market. Why has that been slower to go electronic? Um, and is that an Asia pack phenomenon or is that global? Uh, I think that's a global phenomenon. Um, I, I think from a if you, if you take a classical asset manager long only um, a bond, you know, if you're trading a million treasury 10 year benchmark, then that's very straightforward to automate. Um, if you do uh, dollar swaps, in principle, it's the same, but um, because it's perceived, I, I suppose there is more components to a swap than to a bond. Um, it's just been, it's been slower. And as I said, people just been focused very much on the bonds because I think also the trade counts a lot higher. The other thing is a big participation group in the swap space is hedge funds. And as I said, they have uh, been uh, not adopting um, uh, automation quite as uh, aggressively as the, the long only uh, real money uh, type of clients. But as I said, that, that shift is changing. That's why I think that's where, where we're going to see a lot of adoption happening in the next couple of years. Yeah. We've seen some big global shifts. Uh, one was um, has been ongoing now, uh, which was the move away from LIBOR uh, for, for pricing uh, swaps and other instruments, uh, moving to a variety of new benchmarks. Um, I, I don't, so far and so far, and I don't remember what the, the acronyms of all these, but uh, obviously that was a huge change. Is that is that sort of thing something that also drives uh, electronification as people have to rethink the way that they're uh, just pricing all of these things? 
I mean, change always prompts people to to revisit things. I think the the trend was already well underway. Um, I think the the mandate to clear um, certain types of swaps, for example, was probably a stronger driver. Uh, but it it continues to to benefit, right? And I think the other thing is uh, more we get more at the end of the day. Um, you know, people get comfortable with it. They need to try it out. Um, both on the buy side as well as on the sell side, right? And, uh, you know, the more the the buy side electronifies, as I come back to that point, is if the sell side um, starts to auto-quote um, more products, um, that is attractive for the buy side because it, it makes the benefit of trading electronically even higher because you go from getting quotes back uh, over, over chat or phone, uh, which does take some time, to getting an, a price instantaneous, right? And it is, yeah. I know now, right now, what I can get really helps clients to then um, move things forward uh, with the with the electronic equation and more trading electronically. Another big trend this year, the United States is supposed to move to T plus one settlement times. Uh, does that sort of thing also have an impact? So maybe we could localize this a little bit, you know, what does that mean for, for buy and sell sides in Asia? Um, you know, do, do they have to take, you know, is that going to have a big effect and are they going to be more reliant on automation to make sure that they're able to meet those new settlement times? Um, it, it's an interesting question. I mean, we, we deal with um, short settlement cycles, for example, in Japan um, already. And I think what we've seen is, uh, and not not going to say that that's going to hold true for for dollars, right? It's a it's a very different market. But in Japan, we see many of the offshore clients um, settling T plus two just so that nothing delays, um, and there's um, the efficiency guaranteed, right? Because a settlement fail is not what they want. But um, ultimately, right, it comes back down. If it's done electronically, you have the audit log, you have um ideally pre-trade integration post-trade integration with the platform it makes everything more efficient and the information flows directly to the operations teams so there is a lot of benefit of trading electronically um, that help with these type of regulatory changes uh, quite a bit and i think the clients want to take advantage of that as much as possible We've talked about products and, uh, and and general sense of uh, electronification. Let's talk about the data side. So, as you because you know, data is a part of the of the set of uh, the suite of services that AIX provides. What is the data that you're working with, um, and and what are some of the value adds that you can create by by generating this data or 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 uh, offering some sort of data-led services to your users? It's a, it's a very good question. And um, I like to work with data um, in principle because it's fact-based, right? Um, I think the the first thing that we started to realize when clients um, adopt automation is um, sometimes we have surprises in the data which surprise the client itself, um, which is a good thing, right? Um, to give a particular and example, we're talking about clients... pricing data. Are we talking about execution data? So, what is the kind of data that are the is most relevant for for your users? Um, I think it's it's all of the above plus dealer mm. performance, right? The big right. Uh, part that the buy side looks at is dealer performance, and they want to measure that, right? And one thing that we uh, see when discussing with the buy side, in particular, is and, and I think that's quite interesting, is when they trade manual it's very hard to track why did they select a particular dealer to be included or not included in a particular RFQ. And that's where automation um, comes in and actually provides high quality data because it allows you to collect that data systematically. And we can track why was a dealer included? Why was a dealer not necessarily included in a particular RFQ? And then subsequently, it also allows the clients to look at the performance depending on on those selection criteria and whether the assumptions they've made based off the the, the selection uh, options that they have 
actually match up with um, what they then see in the in the data when they have done trades, right? And that also kind of leads to a perpetual cycle of clients trying to optimize and adjust uh, the rules so that they can get the best possible outcome um, for their trades. Um, I think the other big part of data that, that we've seen is um, transaction cost analysis is, is very, mm. very popular. We have um, clients that are Asia-based um, who, based off transaction cost analysis that they've done, have decided that um, they may trade the treasuries not necessarily during Asia hours, but they will try to trade them at the New York close um, using AX, uh, the, the, fu the functionality called time release, which allows them to put in an order now and have it released at uh, the US close when, in all fairness, they are not necessarily at their desks, right? Because it's in the middle of the night, uh, but they are able to capture tighter spreads uh, in, in, in some instances uh, that they have concluded that that's worth it having that optionality to trade that way. In the equities world in Asia, there's a uh... The different markets have um, their quirks, uh, which which systematic traders can take advantage of. So it's perhaps, um, you know, there, there might be an auction or volume tends to aggregate at the beginning of the day or the end of the day, uh, and it can vary from market to market. Uh, and so this leads to um, different trading strategies and also different ways to evaluate the, I guess, the the alpha. The, what are you seeing in the bond world? Um, is it also, you also have these sorts of, of idiosyncratic uh quirks in in different local markets that the people if they go electronic and they're using data can can outperform and and create value yes um we, we definitely see that right we as similar as you described in in the closing auctions um we do have closes um they're not auctions but we do have close times for um, major currencies and, and especially the government bond markets of the of the various countries in the region and that leads to concentration of of uh, activity and the concentration of liquidity and uh, how should I say some clients may have started to look at how they can take uh, advantage of that um, is it as evolved as in equities I don't think so but I said we're only about to starting to see some of these participants which have historically, uh, contributed or tried to take advantage of that to really start to embrace that um, systematically and, and on an automated basis um, in the cash space. One of the, I guess, the best things about when you're automating markets is it, it it does create new ways to attract liquidity, to build liquidity, and to to take advantage of liquidity. That's you know, liquidity is usually the the lifeblood of a of a trader, right? Uh, you know, he or she is always looking, you know, and and exchanges that can provide or or, or venues that can provide that kind of liquidity are, are going to succeed. Um, so as we as we come to a close here, Laurent, I'd like to get your sense of as you see these markets improving, as the technology continues to advance and be adopted, where do you see the liquidity moving? Uh, do you have any kind of predictions for us that we could look forward to into twenty twenty four? It's a it's a good question. Is is liquidity gonna get better? I, we always hope so, right? Uh, ultimately, as you said, it's the lifeblood of of every trader. Um, I think what we will see is as technology evolves, people will be able to do more and more of the things that they do electronically more efficiently, and it's gonna allow them to trade more frequently. And more frequent trading should mean a better offset of risk. Um, across the market, both buy side as, sell, as well as sell side. And that in return should improve the liquidity, uh, we'd hope. Well, that's a, certainly a good thing to, to, to bank on and, to, and to, to help build into your business. Any other last thoughts for the coming year? Um, anything we should be expecting from TradeWeb? Um, we're going to continue to invest in the region. Um, we think it's a, a very important uh, part and we see um, that continuously by having clients who support us. Um, and yeah, it's going to be it's going to be exciting to be uh, working with them and exciting to grow uh, the automated business in the APAC region. Well, I certainly look forward to you know following this, and uh, I'm sure we'll more to more to discuss in this space. So, uh, just leaves it to me to say, Lauren Ishii, thank you so much for joining me on Digfin Vox.
Jamie, thank you for having me.